So I'd like to walk you through the Wisconsin breast cancer data analysis. So this is intended to be a, um, uh, you know, an example of how you would build a predictive analytic model. So this is a pretty famous data set. It's available on the UCI machine learning repository. And what we have are um, nine measures of, uh, from, from a lab. Um, uh, we have about 600 or so uh, uh, tumors. And um, we, we, we want to be able to classify these as either cancerous or not. Um, so the Y variable indicates whether the tumor was ultimately cancerous. And so you're going to see about, about a third of all the cases uh, were, were cancerous. Two thirds are, are benign. And so we want to be able to uh, use these lab measures uh, as, as uh, you know, to determine whether or not or predict whether or not the, the uh, tumor is cancerous. So the first thing you usually want to do is to have uh, a test set. And so uh, in, in this case, I, I assigned 60% of my cases to the training set and about 40% to the test set. So I have this variable now, which is um, going to, you know, I'm going to use as a dummy to exclude the test set when I fit my models. Now, um, another thing that I always do when I'm, when I'm building a predictive model is to look at the correlation matrix. And so I, I look at it for a number of things. First off, let's go see how all of my, my uh, predictor variables relate to the Y. And so I see positive correlations across the board suggesting that higher levels of all of these uh, individual axes um, are associated with, with cancer. Um, the only other thing I'll, I'll mention is that X, X9 seems to have less of an association. It still is a positive association. It's just not as strong. Now, the other thing uh, you should note is that there are substantial correlations between all your Xs. You know, so X2 and X3 have a correlation of 0.9. Uh, I see a lot of 0.7s in here, a lot of, of uh, you know, 0.6s indicating quite a bit of multicollinearity. So these variables can all serve as proxies for one another. Um, all right. One thing that I often do is um, I, I just dump things into a random forest at the beginning to see how much there is to explain. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always curious to see if I can do as well with a linear model as I do with a random forest. Um, random forests automatically find nonlinearities and interactions. And so, you know, if my random forest does quite a bit better than a linear model, what that tells me is that um, if I really want to use a linear model, then I need to uh, work a bit harder to find transformations and interactions. If the random forest does about as well as the linear model, what that tells me is um, I, I, there's probably not much more to find because um, you know, linear models doing as well as this very flexible model. All right, so a couple of um, just notes on this. Um, you're going to see that I'm, I'm only going to use the training sample. And um, I, I had to do something. I flipped the, the order. Uh, otherwise, the random forest is going to model the probability of not cancer. And you're going to come to the, you know, the opposite conclusion um, than, than you'd like. Um, I, uh, I also keep the random forest so that I can do some partial dependence plots. So you need that argument if you have a test set and you want to generate partial dependence plots. So the first thing to note is that your error rate with, um, you know, out of bag is extremely low, indicating the random forest does very well. All right. Uh, if we go look at our AUC value, um, the AUC is 0 0.9934, um, which is, um, we, you know, remember the best possible AUC you can have is, a, is 100%. So the random forest is getting almost everything there is to get, and it's going to be really hard to beat. If we actually go look at the RU, uh, AUC curve, here it is. Um, so, Sensitivity is the, um, 
is, is the true positive rate. Specificity is the false positive rate. And so basically what this is showing us is that we can find uh, all of the true positives with almost no false positives. So this point up here would say you're, you're getting 100% of the true positives with extremely few false positives. So this model is extremely good, is, is what this is saying. Um, it's kind of interesting to go look at the um, at a histogram of the predicted probabilities. And what this is showing is that you have a whole lot of probabilities where you're almost certain it's cancerous. You have a lot of probabilities where you're almost certain it's not cancerous. And there's not a lot in between. So if you choose your cutoff anywhere in here, you know, you're going to isolate all the cancerous cases and all the, those that you're sure that are not cancerous. And there's not, not a lot of uncertainty. So this is... Um, I'd say a fairly easy problem uh, to, to model. Still, I think it's, it's kind of good to go through the steps. If we go look at our variable importance plots, um, what, uh, what this is saying is that x2 seems to be the most important predictor. x6 and 7 are, are also fairly important. Um, x9 is not at all important. It rarely enters your trees for the random forest. You get these other axes that are that, that sometimes enter. All right, but let's just remember two is the most important. Six and seven come in quite a bit. Well, look, what are the effects like? So remember, two is the most important. So I make some partial dependence plots. This is describing how does uh, you know the level of this variable affect whether or not the tumor is cancerous. What I'm seeing here is basically a threshold function. If you have low levels of X2, you don't need to worry. Whenever you go above about a value of 3, um, there's a pretty high chance of cancer, and the effect just flattens out. You see a pretty similar effect with X7, except the threshold, um, well, I guess the threshold's in about the same place. Values less than 3, no problem. Values greater than 3 means you have a problem. Uh, likewise with x6. Now, the fact that I'm seeing threshold functions, so threshold functions meaning it's flat, and then we see a big uh, jump, uh, mean that trees are extremely well suited for this because trees do threshold functions. So um, let's go try a boosted tree. So I'm not going to take through the syntax on this, but um, the, the boosted trees basically tell you the same thing. X2 is extremely important. X6 and 7 are the second most important variables. X9 doesn't matter much. All right. Uh, if we go look at the AUC values, I, uh, I started out with only a thousand stumps, and you're going to see your AUC value is not as good as random forests. It's still really good. Uh, 0.998 is a pretty strong AUC value but um, not quite as good as the 0.99 whatever that we had with random forests. So I've probably not uh, learned enough. So if I increase the number of stumps, you're going to see that AUC jumps up to uh, the same range as we had with random forests. If you go further, uh, it doesn't help you much. So it doesn't help you at all, actually. So, um, you know, 5,000 5, stumps is about all we need. We can also look at our partial dependence plots with the boosted trees, and you see similar threshold effects. So both for x2 and x3. Uh, this slightly bothers me that uh, things go down and then up. Uh, so that, you know, I, I, I think we, what we have is a monotonically increasing function, and it shouldn't go up and then down and then up again. There are ways to address this with GBM but I haven't really talked about those in, in lectures. So look at the monotonicity constraints if you're interested. Um, well, we could try to increase the interaction depth. There isn't much, uh, much more to explain, to be honest with you, but let's go try it. Um, so if I in increase the interaction depth, this would allow for interactions between variables. And uh, basically, uh, same variables are most important. Uh, AUC doesn't go up by much. So the interactions don't help us. Let's go look at a simple tree. So if I 
fit a simple tree, it gives me a fairly big tree. And what comes into that tree? Well, the same variables that were coming into the random forest and boosted tree. So x2, x6, see a little bit of x7. Some of the other variables are creeping in, so x3, x8, x1. Um, I'm not sure we need all these branches, though. So why is that? Well, first off, look, um, both of these cases are classified as non-cancerous, so I really need this split. It's, it's not telling me anything different. Likewise, I see a situation here where all of these are non-cancerous. Why introduce the split? Everything in this sub-branch is cancerous. Why do I need these additional splits? So I'm going to go look at a, um, at a, at a, at a CV, uh, cv.tree plot. Um, so this does k-fold cross-validation, and it says you don't need more than about four or five nodes. Going out to 10 or 12 nodes, whatever we had here, really isn't helping you uh, on, on uh, the cross-validated data. So let's go prune our tree, and I just said best equals five. I could have used four. And what you end up with is something that's um, it's very simple, uh, you know, simple way to classify it. If you have um, x2 values bigger than about 3, bigger, bigger than 2.5, so 3 or more, you're, in ri you're at risk of having cancer uh, unless your x2 value is small, then you shouldn't worry about it. If you have small x2 values but big x6 values, then, then, you're, um, then you have uh, uh, risks. So um, with only two variables in the model, we can easily visualize it with partition.tree. And uh, I really like this plot. So I've superimposed the raw data points. I've jittered them, which means you add a little bit of random noise um, so that, that you can see where you have all the values. So you have a lot of values here, you have a lot of values up here. All these values are very uh, unusual. And um, this kind of confirms what the random forest was saying. Uh, whenever x2 or x6 are at all big, chances are it's cancer. Now there are a couple outliers here where these are non-cancerous cases, but, but they're extremely rare. I mean, these, these are almost perfectly separated. Likewise, when, when, these, uh, when these values are small, you don't need to worry about having cancer. Um, I almost see kind of a linear boundary here. So there's a linear boundary between the cancerous cases and the non-cancerous cases. I think the tree might be making a mistake here, so not that there's a lot of cases, but um, most of these are not in cancerous. There's only one cancerous case, but the tree calls it cancerous. Um, this we'd probably want to call cancerous, cancerous, you know, this, this one's a toss-up. All right, uh, you could do a similar plot for x7 and come to roughly the same conclusion. All right, well, let's go try a GAM. And um, so I just put the three most important variables in. And if I look at my non-parametric effects, it's saying you don't need a nonlinear effect for x7. You probably don't need it for x2. And I'm not sure about x6. If we go look at the plots, I think x6 is overfitting. Again, I, you know, what I'm kind of expecting, I don't, I don't know much about this domain, but I'm expecting monotonically increasing functions. The spline is going up and down and up again, which is probably overfitting. Um, so we could probably, um, you know, just do a spline on x6 and see if things get better, but, you know, the, the, this is suggesting we don't need the nonlinear uh, splines. I'm going to go straight to a lasso. And so if I do the lasso with using cross-validation, what it says is I need to shrink a little bit, not a lot. Um, none of the coefficients get shrunk to zero. And so here you're, you're actually, you know, your estimated coefficient. As the correlation matrix showed, they all have a positive association with churn, not, not, not with churn, with cancer. Um, if we go try the AUC plot, you're going to see uh, you know, Lasso does um, you know, about the same as, as, as random forests and boosted trees. The AUC is actually just a tiny bit better out in the third decimal place. 
but I wouldn't. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure that that's um, you know, just sampling variation or whether that it really is better. But uh, the lasso model does extremely well, kind of confirming what I was seeing with those plots. The decision boundaries are are, uh, are basically linear in this case, so you don't need a, a fancy tree model. You could just get by with lasso. Um, just for fun, we're going to talk about PCA uh, in, in chapter 10. This, um, this does a dimensionality reduction, and um, you can visualize all, you know, in this case, eight dimensions in a two-dimensional space, and you see that the first uh, dimension kind of captures everything. When you get beyond this value, um, it's all uh, non-cancerous. Anything less than this is cancerous. I'm not sure this adds much beyond the, um, the, the scatter plots I had with the tree, but um, kind of interesting to look at. Okay, I hope that helps. Um, you know, the point I'm trying to make is uh, you want to try all of these different machine learning methods. You want to have a test set. You want to use cross-validation to choose the smoothing parameters. Uh, and in this case, I'd recommend probably the lasso because it's, um, it's a simpler model than having, uh, you know, forests of trees. Although the trees, uh, you know, the random forests and the boosted trees uh, do equally well, but I'm, I'm kind of a fan of uh, linear parsimonious models when when they work. Okay.